let's lift up our voices together and sing this hymn. Oh God, our help. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Under the shadows, under the shadow of thy throne, still may we dwell secure. Sufficient is thine arm alone, and our defense is sure. Let's sing, oh God.
lift us up. So we give you thanks and we give you praise. You are with me. What can separate us? You are for me. What can stand against us? Your love, it won't let go. I know it won't. Darkness, shadows have no power over me. Fear is empty. Shame has no authority. Your love, it won't let go. I know Let's it declare, won't. I know. Cause I know your thoughts, your blessings. and freedom. Healing and freedom as you speak favor over me. Faith is breaking all impossibility. Your name has overcome. Your name, I know your thoughts because I know your thoughts, your plans for me. Your promises, cause your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Let's sing it together. I'm standing. Oh, I am standing on every promise that you make. I will see it come to pass in your name, in your name. Jesus, I will trust. Every word I hear you say, I will see it come to pass in your name, in your name. I am standing, I am standing on every promise that you make. I will see it come to pass in your name, in your name. Jesus, I will trust every word I hear you say. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. The weapon. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. Because when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph Oh my God will never fail We declare it today, my God Oh my God will never fail So I'm gonna sing Oh, I'm gonna see a victory Cause I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord see a victory cause I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord there's power in the mighty name there's power in the mighty name of Jesus cause every war he wages he will win cause I'm not backing down from any giant I know how this story ends. I know, I know, I know. I know how this story ends. Oh, I'm gonna see a victory. Cause I'm gonna 
promises and the power of your word. Increase our faith, O oh God, as we seek you and as we trust you today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jill, and I'm so glad you joined us for worship this weekend. If you're new or visiting us today online, I want to extend a special welcome. You can go to cachurch.com or to our mobile app for more info and also to fill out a connection card online so that we can get in touch with you. Our next partnership class is coming up soon. When we partner together, we become a unified movement and make a difference in our church, homes, community, and the world. If you've only been visiting Christian Assembly or you're new to the area, or maybe you're wondering how God can use your gifts to impact our community, partnership is the key. We have an in-person and online option. As You Go is a four-week seminar focusing on the joy and the power of conversational evangelism. We often feel intimidated by evangelism, but this seminar will show how restful and casual it can be. Join in on Thursday nights in October. Our stewardship ministry is offering a free seminar, Estate Planning for Everyone, where you will learn to be empowered to make important decisions that impact your life, loved ones, and legacy. Whether you're single, married, or retired, register for this seminar that covers topics such as living trust and protecting your assets. We encourage you to give online through our Christian Assembly LA app or our website by clicking on the Give tab. And we want to say thank you for your ongoing generosity and giving. Well, you guys, last weekend at our indoor services, we celebrated 11 baptisms. So take a look at this video and see some of those that were baptized and hear their stories. Afterward, we'll hear from Scott Quay and our kingdom update for the month. I believe that following Jesus makes me a better mom to my children and helps me live a truly happier life. I'm being baptized to publicly declare my faith in Jesus. Before trusting Jesus, my life was very bland. Now I feel more alive, and he is helping me open up to others. Jesus saves you from blandness, so James. I trust him because I know he is with me no matter how afraid or worried I am. I'm getting baptized because I believe Jesus is real and Jesus is in control. He is an amazing savior, and he will make your paths straight. Once I understood what baptism is, I decided that I wanted to be baptized. I want everyone to know that I have accepted Jesus into my heart and I really want to share Jesus with the world. 
Then he showed me the hill with the cross. Jesus told me that he would forgive me as many times as I need him to. I want to be baptized because I want a new start in life with Jesus. Trusting Jesus changed how I pray, how I listen to sermons at 6, 7, 8, and how I talk to my life group and my friends. I encountered Jesus again at the 6, 7, 8 Hume camp. During worship, Jesus spoke to me in a vision saying, go get baptized. That night when I told my retreat leader, another girl was encouraged to get baptized too. Knowing Jesus as my friend, Lord, and Savior has given me more joy, peace, and hope. I am happy that God has a plan for my life and I can put my trust in Him. I want to be baptized to take the next step in my faith in Jesus. Well, hey, church family, my name's Scott, and it's a Kingdom Weekend. We take time once a month to highlight how God's moving through our church as we follow Him on mission. I'm really excited to share about an upcoming Kingdom Conference that's happening right here at CA on October 23rd called Compelled. We're a church that's compelled by Christ's love to share his love with those around us. And God's called all of us to join him on mission, especially during such a time as this. This past year and a half has been so hard and we have a unique opportunity to reach people with the hope of Christ. This conference will equip you on how to live out your kingdom calling in your everyday life in a practical way that's relevant to the times that we're in. We're gonna have a main session with Doug Shout returning as our speaker, breakout sessions led by missional leaders, and a time of debrief and prayer. The conference is free and lunch will be provided. So I encourage you to come out, join us. You can find more information and register at cachurch.com kingdom. Well, now we get to hear from one of our kingdom partners, Josh Brote with Fellowship of Christian Athletes in the San Fernando Valley. Before we hear from Josh, let's check out this exciting video from FCA. In 1954, God implanted into the heart of a basketball coach a vision that sports could be used as a vehicle to share the message of Jesus Christ. This idea was so compelling that it impacted the influencers. There is a reason for this Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Athletics has a place. Why this thing of fellowship of Christian athletes seems to have arisen in the mind of a few men. But not just two or three gathered together. But millions of people everywhere dedicated to a common cause. The potential is almost beyond conception. Think of the power of this group through all the nations of the world. And that influence continues today. Hey, CA family. My name is Josh Brote, and I am the area representative for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes in the San Fernando Valley. Thank you to each one of you for your support. You are all part of a large team helping to lead coaches and athletes into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. In the Valley, we have campus huddles, which are student-led clubs where we share the gospel of Jesus. We also host sports camps and clinics, and we put on events like Fields of Faith, where students from around the Valley encourage each other to read the Bible and apply it to their lives. Over the past six years, myself and wonderful FCA volunteers have shared the gospel on 18 Valley campuses. As a result, we've seen close to 5,000 students put their faith in Jesus for the first time. FCA has been a beacon of hope for our athletes and coaches during the pandemic. And during our Zoom huddles, we dove deep into the Bible together. Andrew, who is a cross-country runner at John Burroughs High School, is one of those student athletes. He originally thought that faith was about getting God to love him based only on his performance. But through our weekly huddles, Andrew came to a new understanding of God's unconditional love for him that he says eliminated the burden of perfection and performance. Andrew is now inviting others to come and join him in the freedom he's experiencing. Here's a photo of him and a friend running in our 5K event last year. Now, we're excited to get back onto campuses this fall where we'll be able to continue to share the gospel and develop our student leadership teams. Please pray for us as we navigate this ministry and some of the changes we're facing. 
Please also pray for more volunteers to help guide students like Andrew into vibrantly growing relationships with Jesus. Thank you. We're so thankful for how God's moving through FCA in the San Fernando Valley. And it's amazing how many students have placed their trust in Jesus Christ over these past years that we've partnered with them. So let's go ahead and pray for Josh Broughton FCA. God, we thank you so much for how you're moving so powerfully on campuses in the Valley through FCA. And we just ask God in this season that you'd open doors to get back on campuses, that students be reached right where they are, discipled and come to know you, Lord. And I just pray God for a move of your spirit this fall and to refresh Josh, encourage him, Lord. Thank you so much for who he is. We pray, Lord, just a blessing on that ministry in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I wanna say thank you for your generosity to the Kingdom Offering, which supports all of our Kingdom efforts, both locally and globally. Because of our giving, we were able to send $10,000 towards relief efforts happening in Haiti after the devastation of the earthquake back in August. We sent the funds to Compassion International, who's on the ground there in Haiti, working with local churches. The $10,000 is going to the most essential needs for families devastated by the earthquake. That includes emergency food kits, hygiene packs, and temporary shelters. So thank you so much for your generosity towards these important relief efforts. I wanna encourage us that our giving matters and you can give to our kingdom offering that supports all of our missional efforts, both locally and globally. You can give online to the kingdom offering through our CA website or app by clicking the kingdom offering tab. Thanks so much for linking arms in God's mission together. Hey, welcome everybody. Any visitors or guests, my name is Tom. What a privilege and joy that you're here with us today. To my CA family, great to be with you as well. I am so grateful for you. I've been praying for our time together and I, and I just have a heart of love for you. Well, we have been in a series that is about winning the war in our mind. C.S. Lewis once addressed the challenges of winning the war in our mind this way. He said that mental pain is less dramatic than physical pain, but it's more common and it's also harder to bear. He went on to say the frequent attempt to conceal mental pain increases the burden. It's easier to say my tooth is aching than to say my heart is broken. Well, I've been praying that this series would be helpful to you directly, as well as to equip you to help and to minister to those that you know who are around you, your, your loved ones, your friends, your coworkers, your classmates who might be struggling. But that being said, this series could never be exhaustive on all the issues of mental pain and mental health that we all may face. So if you or someone you know is struggling with ongoing mental health issues, as strongly as I can say it, as your pastor, I want to encourage you or for you to encourage them to seek a qualified Christian counselor or medical professional. You know, the Bible regularly affirms the wisdom of having wise counselors in your life. In fact, Proverbs 24, verse 6 says, For you should wage war with sound guidance. Victory comes with many counselors. You know, throughout my life, I've found that God provides great help in having wise counselors in every area of my life. In fact, one of the great gifts in my life is a counselor on our staff team named Nan Duet. I've uh, shared things with her, she's prayed with me, she's counseled me, and I've felt great strength and great help in winning the war in my own mind. Well, each week we are learning one of four principles from God's Word to renew our minds. Week one, we learned the replacement principle, which is to remove the lies and replace it with truth. Last week, we learned the rewire principle, rewire your brain and renew your mind. This week, we're gonna jump into the third principle, and here it is. It's called the reframe principle. 
Reframe your mind, restore your perspective. The reframe principle. We're going to consider that, but before we do, let's pray. Lord, I pray for all those who are within the sound of my voice that you would help us to learn from your word how to reframe our mind, reframe our thoughts. Lord, I pray both for those who are hearing this message and it's going to directly help them, but I also pray for all the people that are just one relationship away who maybe aren't hearing this message, but we who are hearing it can be strengthened and equipped to help those who are struggling. So God, would you speak to us now, first for ourselves from your word, but also equip us to serve your purposes in the lives of others from your word, to help them as well win the war in their mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we've been saying, our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. So if you want to change your life, you have to change your strongest thoughts. As I've been working on this series, I've been asking myself this question, like, Tom, what kind of series is this? Like, is it a mental health series? Is it a series about faith? Is it a series about discipleship? And I've decided that the answer is yes. It is all of those things because they are all so interconnected. Our thoughts are critical to how we understand and follow Jesus. That's why the book of Romans tells us this. It says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you. Now here it is. Transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. How we think creates a lens through which we view life. Sometimes those lenses can become distorted to the point that we have a standardized, consistent pattern of deviating or having a distortion from reality and how we see things and how we process things. Social psychologists have a term for this. They call it cognitive bias, a bias in how we think. And we see examples of this all the time in our everyday life. For example, maybe in the workplace, two employees are given the exact same feedback on their performance by their supervisor. Maybe they're on the same team and the feedback was for the whole team. One of them receives the feedback as a bit hard to hear, but assesses it as fair and helpful. And so they walk away and they think, man, I'm so glad that they told me that. Now I can make the changes I need to help serve our mission together better. But the other one who just heard the exact same words is deeply offended. So they begin to think thoughts like this. Well, who does she think she is coming in here and giving me feedback like that? How dare she? What's the difference? Their cognitive bias is the difference. Perhaps the second person had a demanding and insulting parent. So now they see every authority figure through that lens And it might not only distort how they interact with their supervisor at work, it might distort even how they see and understand God. So if then they don't correct that bias, that that lens, that glasses through which they see the world around them and how they think, in time if they don't correct it, They will either just go from job to job to job, convinced that they just always happen to get the horrible bosses that are out there, But even more deeply, they might have a harder time feeling connected to God as well. So the bad news is, is that our lens through which we view life can be distorted. But the good news is that doesn't have to be the end of the story with God's help. We can reframe our minds to restore our perspective. Now, how exactly do we do that according to God's word? The first thing is this, to reframe your present by cross-examining your thoughts with facts. Jesus said that the devil is the father of lies. So then knowing objective facts is one way of helping us cut through the mental noise and the bias and the anxious thoughts that we all have and are surrounded by. In other words, facts are our friends. 
If we have an unknown cognitive bias, if we're believing a lie, we believe a deception, we think it's true, it is facts that God can use as a God-given tool to help us break free from that bias. That's what Proverbs means when we're told in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Or as 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5 instructs, you should keep a clear mind in every situation. A clear mind examines the facts to ensure that you don't pray, uh, fall prey to mental biases. See, a worldview bias that is not based on facts can lead us to making unwise decisions really in almost any area of our life. For example, this happened many years ago, but true story. A man came to see me about a pastoral situation he was facing. And we weren't talking about this particular issue, but at the end of our time, he changed topics and he said something like this. He said, well, now that the other political party is going to be in control, I sold all my stock investments because that party always destroys the economy and the market. And he went on to advise me in strong terms that, you know, I should go home and do the same thing and just sell all my retirement uh, mutual funds and everything. So I said to him on his way out the door, I said, well, send me the link to the research you reviewed with the facts so I can review it as well. And he responded and he said, well, I didn't actually look at any research. I've just lived long enough to know that it's true. Well, I'm a curious guy. And uh, so I decided to do the research, right, to, to dig into the facts. And it turns out that over a 75-year 75 period, 75 period of history, when one certain political party has control of both the White House and Congress, so kind of total political control on a national level, the market historically returned an average of about 7%. But what about when the opposite political party had control of the White House and both, uh, both chambers of Congress? Well, the market returned an average of about 8%. So there is a difference, but it's a pretty small difference, not a huge one. And actually, if you kind of step back, both of them were averaging positive returns. So my friend's unexamined mental bias made him severely overestimate the impact of politics when it comes to investing well. Now, I hesitated to use this example, uh, though it's a true example, because I don't want your cognitive bias to cause you to misunderstand me, right? I am not saying that how we vote doesn't matter. I'm also not saying that market returns are the only or even the main reason to vote. I vote I believe we should study God's word, we should study the issues, study the candidates, and prayerfully vote our conscience humbly before God. But the point is, is that the unexamined anxious thoughts can lead us to actual unwise decisions. That's why Proverbs chapter 4 verse 26 says, give careful thought, there we hear it again, careful thought to the paths for your feet. And be steadfast in all of your ways. Careful thought requires us to examine our thinking and really cross-examine our thinking with objective facts. Now, if my friend really did dump all of his investments, he would have lost out on the gains over the next few years while the party that he opposed was in power. And by the way, I have friends on a wide political spectrum, including people who affiliate with no political parties, and people express fear on both sides on this, that whoever's in power, it's all going to go downhill and, and the market's going to uh, wreck the market. So cognitive bias runs both ways, it seems. Proverbs eighteen seventeen says this, the first one to plead his case seems right until another comes and cross examines him. Where do you have an anxious thought that could be leading you to false conclusions because you've not slowed down long enough to examine the facts? You might be thinking, my marriage is struggling, so I guess it will always struggle. But that's not true. 
You can do the research yourself, but the facts are, as I've researched it, that many struggling marriages turn around and thrive with God's help. You might be thinking, well, I'm too young or I'm too old to be used by God. You might be thinking, my best days are behind me or my best days are when I get older. But that's not true because the facts are throughout God's word that God used both young and old people all the time in the Bible. You might be thinking, I'll never be able to break this sinful habit that I have. But that's not true because whatever habit you have, I can point you to someone who has broken that same habit with God's help one step at a time. So first, winning the war in your mind includes careful thinking about the facts. Now, there's a book that came out in, I think it was 2018, maybe 2017. The title of it is called Factfulness by Hans Rosling. Uh, It's not written necessarily from a Christian perspective, but it goes through a lot of the biases that we have, and it shows, it was written before the pandemic, but it shows how a lot of things that we think about the state of the world are not actually correct. So I encourage you, if you want to dig in more to cognitive bias and the state of the world, check out that book by uh, Hans Rosling called Factfulness. It's a great read. The second thing that we need to understand about reframing is that you reframe not only your present, but you reframe your past. And here's how we do this. We reframe our past by thanking God for what he didn't do. We need God's help to reframe our past in light of the wider picture, the ongoing story that we couldn't see at that moment in time. Here's what I mean. Many of us can see God's goodness in the prayers that he answered as we had hoped, right? If you you pray for something, it turns out the way you had prayed for in a positive way, that's kind of pretty easy to connect those dots and feel a sense of gratitude about it. But here's the thing, if you only do that, you miss out on half of God's goodness to you. Because sometimes God's goodness is shown in what he didn't do in our past, I often say that there's three versions of our story, right? There's the honest version, the more honest, and the most honest version. Here's the honest version of my story. I like to lean on my own understanding of how things should unfold in my life. And here's a little bit deeper, more honest version of my story. Sometimes I think that if God would just get his act together and do what I want, when I want it, then everything would be great. But here's the most honest version. God knows that I don't know as much as I think I know. So sometimes his goodness is shown to me by what he doesn't do. Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Now here's the thing about straight paths. Straight paths, whenever they are interpreted by our anxious, controlling, worried filters, can often start out seeming like they're a story of disappointment or confusion or unanswered prayers. Think about some of the the best people or the best things in your life right now. And I would bet that some of those things are the result of God's goodness to you through prayers that he didn't answer, doors that he didn't open, things that he didn't do, the job that you didn't get, that you were devastated about. But in time, you ended up at a better one that you're more excited about and it fits your skills better. The setback that you experienced But it ended up in time making you a more compassionate, humble person. The relationship that didn't work out. But maybe later God led you to a better fit for you that did. 
Maybe an apartment or a house that you didn't get. I remember in 2007, my wife really and, and I, we really wanted this one house, but it, it didn't work out, which eventually in 2009, it led us to our current location with our current neighbors. And some of our current neighbors have come to Christ. Can you see God working in your life? Maybe by a prayer that he didn't answer. A location, an apartment that you didn't get. For example, in my own life, uh, my senior year of college, I had applied to a certain law school. And after waiting to hear back, I eventually called to see if I had been accepted because it had been a little bit of time. And the woman on the phone in- informed me that yes, I had been accepted, so my heart kind of got excited. And then she said, actually, you even uh, were offered and won a scholarship. So my heart got even kind of more excited. But then she said, but unfortunately, we never heard back from you. So we gave away your spot in the school and we actually gave away the scholarship to the runner-up, the student who was the runner-up. Now, apparently, once I tracked it all down, due to a clerical error, They had some wrong contact information, a twisting set of circumstances, and the offer never got to me. Now, the law school decided that uh, because of the situation, that though they couldn't allow me to enter in because their their class for that incoming year was now filled and they had already given away that year's scholarship, they would offer me the scholarship and a spot in the class the following year. And at the time, I was distraught. I mean, I, I was physically nauseous. I remember hanging up the phone and walking into the the bathroom in my apartment and and, and feeling almost like I was going to vomit. I remember thinking, God, how could you let this happen to me? Well, eventually I calmed down and I realized that it wasn't the end of the world because it just meant that I had a year to kill. Well, upon hearing what had happened, the church that I grew up in invited me to become a pastoral apprentice for one year. Because one of the pastors who knew me thought that maybe God was calling me to be a pastor. So they created this kind of spot for me. And at the time, I figured, well, I, I can serve for a, a year. I mean, and then at the end of the year, you know, I'll go on with my real life. I'll go on to law school. And the rest, as they say, is history. Because God used that year to solidify that he was calling me to be a pastor. Not an attorney. Not calling me to be a judge. I literally would not be speaking to you right now if God had answered those prayers back then. You see, we can see this at work even in some of the challenges that we all face in life. God's goodness shown through maybe ways that they didn't work out exactly as we had prayed. Circumstances that at the time you never would have chosen. You maybe even prayed repeatedly for it to be taken away. The Apostle Paul had that experience too. But he reframes his unanswered prayer as an opportunity and a sign of God's goodness so that Paul could experience the power of Christ at work through him. This is what he says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8 and on. It says, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Speaking about a thorn in his flesh is what he calls it. Each time he would say, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So Paul continues on, so now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. You see, when we reframe our yesterdays, it actually changes our todays. What happened yesterday remains the same, but our perspective can change to see God's goodness at work in all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And what I consider to kind of be this funny, gentle, constant reminder from God to me personally, my office actually here at the church campus used to actually be an attorney's office prior to the church purchasing it years ago and repurposing it for a pastoral office. So every time I walk into my office, I'm reminded of God's sense of humor and that unanswered prayer that actually has led me into what God had called me to do. You see, sometimes in our lives, when it feels like things are falling apart, they might actually be falling 
into place. And we can renew our mind by reframing the past to see God's goodness even in the things he didn't do. The third thing we see is this. So first we, we uh, reframe our present, then we reframe our past. But the third is about our future. We pre-frame our future. You can't control what happens, but you can control how you frame it. We can choose to make the goodness of God our default cognitive bias. In fact, David did this when he wrote the psalm where he said in Psalm 23, verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, how does David know this? Like, his life isn't over. How does he know that, that God's goodness and mercy are going to follow him all the days of his life? Well, he's not counting on circumstances. He's counting on God's unchanging character. And we can too. One of my friends leads a large organization that was facing major challenges beyond his control due to the issues from the pandemic. And he was recounting the different problems that were beyond his control and was talking about uh, his conversation with some of his, his employees, some of his teammates. And then he said this phrase, he said, Tom, I just told them what a wonderful opportunity to trust God. What a wonderful opportunity to trust God. Now, what was he doing? That little phrase, he was pre-framing the future. He wasn't in denial about the current challenges that they faced, but he framed the picture of the future knowing that given enough time that he would see the goodness and mercy of God following him all the days of his life and then for eternity into the house of the Lord forever. You see, the way you frame something will dictate how you think. It will dictate how you respond. It will change how you behave. Consider a challenge that you're facing right now. Let me ask you, what would be the most positive, God-honoring, life-building, mutually edifying way for you to frame or approach or think about that situation? Look, I know many of you, and I know myself, we can be bullheaded in other ways in other areas of life, right? So, so why not choose to be bullheaded about choosing to see the goodness of God as you walk into the future he has for you. This week, I came across the story of a 92-year-old woman who was moving into a nursing home. Her husband of 70 uh, years had just recently passed away. Her eyesight uh, was in decline, and for a variety of health reasons, she couldn't live by herself anymore, so she needed to make the transition to this nursing home. But every morning by 8 a.m., she was fully dressed and her hair was done and was ready for the day. Well, after hours of waiting patiently in the lobby of the nursing home, she smiled sweetly when she was told that her room was now ready for her to move into it. And as she maneuvered her walker to the elevator, the staff person attending her provided a visual description of her tiny room. To which she responded, I love it, with the enthusiasm of an eight-year-old who had just like been presented with a, a new puppy. And the staff member of the nursing home responded and said, Mrs. Jones, how can you love it? You haven't even seen it yet. And then the 92-year-old woman spoke these words. The fact that I haven't seen it doesn't have anything to do with it. Happiness is something you decide on ahead of time. Whether I like the room or not does not depend on how the furniture is arranged. It is how I arrange my mind. You see, if you're in Christ, God's word says that he's working in all things for your good. So make up your mind right now that the fact of God's goodness is going to be your cognitive bias, whether you're looking at your present circumstances, you're thinking about your past, or you're considering your future. Now, in many ways, what I just did was I told you the gospel of Jesus Christ using different language. Knowing the facts, reframing the past, 
and pre-framing the future is really what it means to have a faith in Jesus. The facts are that you were created for a relationship with God. The facts are that you and I have sinned, breaking that relationship, deserving now eternal separation from a holy, just, and holy, good God forever. The facts are that Jesus chose to enter into history to pay for my sin and to pay for your sins that justice demanded. The facts are that Jesus prayed that the Father would take the cross from him. But the facts are that the Father's goodness to you and to me was shown in that prayer that he didn't answer in that moment. And ultimately, Jesus agreed to submit to the Father's will. The facts are that Jesus was crucified on a cross and died on a Friday and was buried. The facts are that it was a devastating day filled with confusion, filled with despair, filled with doubt, filled with darkness. It looked like evil had won. But the facts are that three days later, Jesus rose from the grave and left an empty tomb. And the facts are that when the resurrection of Jesus Christ happened, it reframed what happened on the cross, a day in the past when it seemed like all had been lost. The facts are that we don't call that day Devastation Friday or Hopelessness Friday or Bitter Disappointment Friday or Despairing Friday. The facts are it was reframed and we call it Good Friday. The facts are that what happened on that day remained the same. But now their past, our past, was reframed by the scandalous goodness and mercy of God revealed. Revealed in time through the power of the empty tomb from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fact is, they didn't just reframe their past, but now something changed in their thinking. They pre-framed their future, expecting to see the goodness of God. Don't get me wrong. They knew that, this world, that in this world there would still be trouble. But they could now take heart because they could see that Jesus has overcome the world. Their sins were forgiven. Their future was now secure. And the goodness of God will follow them. And all who come, and choose to become believers and followers of Jesus, the goodness of God will follow you all the days of our lives, and then we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The facts of the gospel not only reframe our past, but it pre-frames our future to expect that whatever comes our way in Christ, God's goodness and mercy will prove in time to be deeper and wider and higher and better and longer and stronger. The greatest power you and I can ever have to win the war in our mind is to think long and hard and deeply and widely about the war that Christ has already won for us. And as we do that, it will reframe our minds and restore our perspective. Let's pray. As we pray now, God, would you apply your word in this message to us individually? Let me ask you, is there anywhere that you need to let the facts cross-examine your thinking, to maybe reveal a cognitive bias. Maybe you have a certain way that you think the world works or a certain way that you think things are, but you really never have done the research. You haven't dug into the objective facts. Maybe you just heard it from someone else or you just think I've been along live and long, I've been alive long enough to know how it all works. I want to encourage you, dig into the facts, the objective facts, And let that cross-examine your thinking to reveal any biases that you might have, any deceptions that you might believe that could be impacting your life. Others of you, when you think about your past, how can you see God's goodness, not only in what he has done and the prayers that he's answered in a way that you could see in a moment of time, but also in the things that he didn't do? It might be a relationship 
that you prayed would continue, but it ended and that actually set the stage for a, a different relationship that turned out to be the right relationship for you. It might be a job opportunity you wanted. It, it might be where you live. It, it could be any area of our life where you say, God, I, as I look back over my past, help me see the ways that your goodness is shown in the things that didn't work out the way maybe I had wanted. How you've made me more humble, more compassionate, maybe more prayerful, maybe more reliant upon God. And for others of us, as you look to the future, I want to encourage you to choose now to pre-frame it. As my friend said, what a wonderful opportunity to trust God. Whatever challenge you're facing that makes you anxious and worried and afraid, I, I just want to say to you, what a wonderful opportunity to trust God. What a wonderful opportunity to begin to look for and expect that you're going to see his goodness and his mercy follow you all the days of your life. And lastly, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to do that now. Jesus Christ came to save sinners like me, like you. The scriptures tell us that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. The scriptures also say, for the joy that was set before him, Christ endured the cross. And what was that joy? It was you being made right with God and right with others for all eternity by your faith in Jesus Christ because his blood shed on the cross covering your sin and the justice of God that was demanded, but at the mercy of God intersecting at the cross and saying, you now can be forgiven because of what Jesus Christ has done. I want to encourage you to say, Christ, I give you my life now. Jesus, I want to be your follower. Teach me to know you and love your word and love God's word all the days of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I might desire to do your will. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, would you just let us know? You can email in, you can call the church, whatever way. Maybe let some others around you that are Christians know. And if you did just pray that prayer, let me just say, welcome, welcome, welcome to the family of God. Your very next step is to be baptized. And I want to encourage you to continue to dig into God's word so that you can win the war in your mind as his truth sets you free. Thank you, everyone. God's peace be with you always come shining through
Thank you so much for being with us today online. If you made a decision to follow Christ at any point during our service, or if you want to know more about what it means to follow Christ, let us know so we can have a pastor follow up with you. You can email us at the address below or go to our webpage listed below as well. Well, let me close with this benediction. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Thanks, you guys. See you next week.